our final, our final keynote for this afternoon will be introduced by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff. Wow. Uh, what an incredible uh, program we just had, and what an incredible finale we have now. I could not be more thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, Colombia's wonderful president, Juan Manuel Santos Calderon, with us. Colombia has had two absolute grand slam home runs for an American. I don't know how many goals that adds up to in a World Cup, but it's a lot of them uh, in recent years. Colombia, and that's Colombia, uh, I should uh, be clear, Colombia was the great innovator of the whole concept of the Sustainable Development Goals. So when the president comes, give him a special thanks for that. It was in 2012 when uh, the governments of the United Nations came together on the 20th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit to ask what to do, given that 20 years earlier at the Earth Summit, a lot of great agreements had been reached, but they had not yet been implemented, and it was the government of Colombia that said, we need to bring this to the people of the world. And they put on the table the idea of sustainable development goals, carried the day, and that brings us to where we are today. And for that, we are all profoundly grateful and in admiration. But the next triumph, I think, is uh, as remarkable and as notable for the world. And that, all of you know, Colombia is the great peacemaker of the world in recent years. Colombia is the country under the president's leadership that ended a decades and decades long war and did so with incredible imagination and creativity. Now, this is our second chance in two years to host President Santos. He was at the World Leaders Forum in September 2015. And I'm not saying it's all causation that he came to Columbia University and then got the Nobel Prize the next year. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to think that there's uh, a little bit there. Uh, but anyway, we uh, are absolutely thrilled for that so meritorious prize and also the inspiration that it gives for the whole world. So it is really a very distinct honor and great pleasure knowing how wonderful uh, this gentleman is and what a world leader he is and how combining peace and sustainable development, it does not get better than that. So please join me in welcoming President Santos to the stage. Hello, President. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, we're so. not choreographed uh, properly. Uh, <laughs> I think we're going to sit and you're going to talk, is that right? Um, or, or you're going to stand and talk. Or if you want to talk and not sit. Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I definitely do not. We're here to listen to you, so please. Okay. If um, you want to use the podium or if you want to speak here, either It's either okay. I'll, I'll speak from... Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for attending this. Uh, it's not a conference. It's simply a sort of a chat. I thought it would be very interesting for you to know how the Sustainable Development Goals were sort of uh, structured, how they finally became uh, a law of the United Nations because it was approved, they were approved by the United Nations in, in the year 20, 
uh, in the year 15, 2015. Uh, and I thought it would be good to carry you uh, on that path of how we did it, uh, how we have been uh, using um, three key words that I want to convey to you that are, were necessary in the implementation of those development goals. Uh, and those three key words were also extremely important for us to be able to reach peace in Colombia after 53 years of war. The first word is ambitious objectives. To put yourself uh, very ambitious objectives. The second is innovate, innovation. And the third, persevere. You have to be persistent in able for, for the objectives to be uh, to become reality. How did the idea of the Sustainable Development Goals emerge? Um, as always, there's some people, some persons, group of people who have very good ideas. The, the, the important thing is to hear them and uh, if they're good ideas, to try to implement them. We have here uh, one of those persons, uh, Paula Caballero, she's here with us. Uh, she was working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The world was discussing uh, what next after the millennium, millennium goals. We had in Colombia been uh, very disciplined in trying to uh, fulfill the millennium goals. Uh, we were about 85% of the goals we managed to, to fulfill. But said, what can we do afterwards? So the idea emerged. Why don't we unite, uh, merge sustainability, which was a, a word that was getting more and more uh, fashionable and important, with development, with uh, the causes of uh, underdevelopment, and how can we uh, rally the whole world around some goals, not only the developing countries. So that's how the idea of why don't we merge these concepts and have the sustainable development goals as a goal for the world. At the beginning, as usually happens, these ideas, especially in the multilateral diplomacy, are very difficult to sell. There was a tremendous degree of skepticism, uh, idea coming from a developing country, and many developed countries said, why should we be part of that? And uh, uh, we started to uh, persist, no, because we think that it's a world problem, not the problem of only the underdeveloped countries. It's a problem of the whole world. Sustainability is the responsibility of the whole world, so we should have goals that involve the whole world. Um, this uh, skepticism started to, to weaken, um, and we started to play multilateral diplomacy. What do, why, what do I mean by that? Multilateral diplomacy needs, uh, think of concentric circles. You need to get a group of countries interested and then enlarge the number of countries interested in whatever cause. We started by the region. Countries, uh, some of the countries were a bit skeptical or lazy. They didn't want, I mean, this is, this is too, too ambitious. This will not work. But other countries got uh, enthusiastic about it. Countries like Peru, uh, Guatemala. They said, oh, that sounds good. Let's, uh, let's work on it. And uh, we started a process of convincing a critical mass of countries of, to, to defend the idea of sustainable development goals. Uh, so the region uh, got involved. Uh, you need also validators uh, from international institutions. Uh, the secretary of the um, Economic Commission for Latin America of the UN, uh, the Mexican, Alicia Barcena, she got very excited. She became 
a great validator. And then we went to other countries. Uh, for example, the uh, United Arab, the Emirates, they got very much uh, involved, very enthusiastic. So slowly it became global. And uh, um, some people asked, uh, but why Colombia? Colombia is a country uh, which has a war. Colombia has many problems. Why, why should Colombia be the leader of this, uh, of this uh, initiative? Uh, the simple reply to that question was, why not? Um, why not Colombia? And uh, the fact that it was an underdeveloped country or developing country uh, suddenly became an asset. Well, coming from a developing country has more credibility. And so the idea uh, started to, to, to become a, a strong idea. And uh, countries started to add their names to the, to the initiative. And uh, finally, in uh, the year uh, 2012 in Rio, uh, we made the proposal, formal proposal, um, that was accepted. Um, what aspects were important for this initiative to really get the strength to be approved three years later by the United Nations in the General Assembly here in New York. Um, I would say, um, since the beginning, we said, let's find validators outside the normal, uh, the, the normal uh, stream of validators, and so the private sector, which usually is not very much involved with UN decisions, um, we invited the private sector to get involved. They were very enthusiastic, and uh, they became tremendous allies all around the world. We invited the civil society. We said civil society must be a part of this. They, sh they, they should understand uh, the, the importance of, of this initiative, and uh, the more civil society gets involved, the more legitimate the initiative will become. And civil society responded very positively. Uh, we made a, a, a tremendous effort for almost every single meeting, and we had hundreds, I think uh, thousands of, of meetings with many people, that civil society was, should always be present there. And that gave the, the initiative a tremendous strength. Finally, in, in, uh, in the year 2012, it was approved. I remember very well the, the Secretary General of the, of the conference, uh, Chinese, uh, stepped down uh, from the podium and, and uh, said to me, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Colombia is a, country, is a small country, relatively small country, but what you, what you have just proposed is a country with big ideas that will have a tremendous impact on development. The Chinese are uh, fully enthusiastic about this initiative and uh, we will support you all the way. And so, finally, in the, the year 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were approved. There was an enormous discussion of how many goals and what goals. Um, this discussion was very academic, but also political. Um, and we finally agreed on the 17 goals after many discussions, the number one goal was uh, poverty, reduce poverty, because poverty is probably one of the uh, worst enemies that sustainability has in the world. Uh, the poverty, it really is a, a, one of the reasons why many of the actions that the world makes against the environment uh, happen. Uh, so reducing poverty as a, as a 
necessary condition to have a sustainable world was uh, one of the goals that we put, and we put it as number one. But the discussion there was fascinating. I remember uh, we were discussing with uh, the British Prime Minister uh, about what goals, how many goals. We had different panels. Our ministers uh, participated in those panels. And uh, somebody from a, a Scandinavian think tank went to my office in Bogota and said to me, y you're doing the wrong thing, President. And I said, why? He said, too many goals, which I thought he had a good argument. Too many goals, but this is a political, also a political uh, discussion uh, to reduce the number of goals right now would be very difficult. And he said, you have the wrong goals. And I said, why do you, do you think we have the wrong goals? And he said to me, what do you think is the most important thing anybody can do in the world to save the planet? And I immediately thought, well, uh, plant a tree, uh, reforest what we have destroyed. I was thinking of uh, Humboldt and what he said 200 years ago, uh, man is destroying the forest and they, uh, mankind will pay for that. And I said, we have to reforest. And he said, no, there is one action which is 10 times more profitable in terms of the dividend for the planet, for the environment, which is uh, saving the coral reefs of the ocean. Um, it was a surprise for me, uh, but uh, it was too late. Uh, we had already sort of agreed on the 17 um, goals, and uh, that type of discussions we had throughout the whole process. But finally, the, the goals were, were agreed, and everybody started to implement the goals. That's a big challenge now. Are we going to fulfill those goals? This brings me to uh, the second uh, example that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we said, OK, Colombia, uh, we need to, uh, to comply and, and, and try to fulfill these goals. Poverty. Um, again, the word innovation, high ab ambitious goals, and perseverance. And we sat down and said, what can we do to be more effective in the fight against poverty? And I remembered a, a former professor of mine. Uh, he was a professor of mine. Um, unfortunately, I didn't go to Columbia. I went to Harvard at the LSE. He was a professor at Harvard at the LSE also. Uh, Amartya Sen, a uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, he had a completely different approach of the traditional approach of how to combat and measure poverty. So I went to him and uh, I said, Professor Sen, you have an institute. He has an Institute of Human Development in the University of Oxford. Um, I would like to try your approach in my country. Uh, will you help me? And he said, of course. And we designed uh, a whole new institutionality, new institutions, and a new approach to fight poverty. We, uh, we defined 45 different factors that a family should have in order to consider him not poor and address those factors with a one-on-one -on -one approach. We, we changed completely our, the way of fighting poverty. And that it helped us tremendously, for example, to focus our social spending in those areas that would have the biggest impact in the fight against poverty. And in the last six years, we've been able to reduce poverty more than any other country in Latin America. We have reduced extreme poverty. We were a very unequal country. We still are. Uh, but we managed to reduce extreme poverty by half. Uh, and if we continue the trend, 
extreme poverty will disappear by the year 2025 from Colombia, being one of the countries with the highest rate of poverty in the whole world. Um, and this has been uh, extremely effective because we innovated, we had a new approach. Now, roughly 60 countries in the world are following this type of, it's called a multi-dimensional uh, poverty approach, are following this, this type of, uh, of policies to, to fight poverty. And uh, that's an example of how we were able to, uh, our being, we will not finish that, finished yet, but we have been advancing uh, satisfactorily in the fight against poverty. Um, we did this with almost every other of the, of the development goals, but I, I'm not going to bore you with the history of the 17. Maybe uh, jump from the number one to number 13, climate change. Uh, in climate change, we, do, we did a, a similar approach. How can we innovate? How, what, what can we do to really contribute uh, to this responsibility that everyone has to stop climate change? Uh, my predecessor was one of those who didn't believe in climate change. So he abolished the Ministry of the Environment. So I said, let's reverse that. And the first thing we do is we have to recreate the Ministry of the Environment. We did that. And we started uh, saying, what is it that we have to do as a country very rich in biodiversity? Col Colombia is the second uh, most biodiverse country in the world, uh, the most biodiverse per square kilometer. The density of biodiversity in Colombia is the highest in the whole world. Uh, and we have, we were endowed by God with tremendous uh, natural resources, water that we need to start protecting areas. So we set ourselves some very ambitious objectives. We had, when I came into government, roughly 13 million hectares of protected forest. Uh, we said, let's double it. Uh, we have already doubled it. Just last, uh, last week, we took a decision to protect uh, one of the, the most biodiverse uh, areas in the whole world in marine biodiversity around uh, uh, an island called Malpelo. It's, it's uh, north of the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, which is, uh, some people say, the richest area in terms of different species of, of fish and, uh, and uh, uh, marine uh, uh, biology. And, uh, that raised our protected areas to 28 and a half million, two and a half million above the target that we had set ourselves at the beginning, and we will continue until until the last the last uh, day of my government. Uh, I have here the minister of of uh, uh, the environment who said, who tells me that if we continue at this rate, we will be over 30 million uh, for sure uh, at the end of the government. We then also said, what is it that we have um, that is uh, important for us to protect? There is a word in Spanish that I don't know why it doesn't have a, a correct translation in English called paramo. Paramo is uh, the sort of the wetlands in the, in the top of the mountains of the mountains that are near the equator. Um, and there are not many paramos in the world, but Colombia has 50%. Those are really factories of water. You go to the paramo and what you see is water going out and that's the source of many, or the, the fountain of many of our rivers. Colombia has more water than uh, United States without Alaska. You go, you fly over Colombia and full of rivers, and we need to protect that. So we started to limit all these. We have 37 of these so-called paramos uh, with a, a unique vegetation, and they, these factories we must protect. We have already protected 24, 25, 
and we will protect, protect the 37 before uh, I leave next year. We also said, who are the, bet, the best uh, guardians of biodiversity and of the environment? Our indigenous people, our indigenous uh, communities. Um, when I took over uh, the, the presidency, before going to the Congress and inaugurating myself, swearing that I will abide by the Constitution, that same day, I went up to a beautiful mountain near the Caribbean uh, coast in a place called the Sierra Nevada, where the uh, oldest indigenous communities are. And I went, we call, we call them our older brothers. I went to them and I asked permission from them, their blessing for me to take over the presidency. And they gave me their blessing, but they said, you have a mandate. You must protect better uh, what they call Mother Earth because you are destroying it, the world is destroying it, and she is getting very mad, and she will react, and you are going to suffer by that. And I said, well, I promise I will do my best. And uh, that week, the worst phenom phenomenon of La Nina, the floodings, started in Colombia. Uh, we have never had such a natural disaster. I had to handle, I had to to handle that for two years, more than three and a half million people who were affected by that. Uh, and they said, this is what I told you when I said that Mother Earth is getting bad. And we had last year the, fir the worst phenomenon of El Nino, the drought uh, that we have ever had in our history. So here we decided to give the indigenous people more land around the protected areas, the natural parks, the reserves, for them to help us protect our biodiversity and our environment. And so we have been expanding and giving them self-governance in order to help us protect the environment. This has been another example of how we have been complying with the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, we, of course, were very active in the negotiations of the Paris Agreement and uh, the Paris Summit uh, for Climate Change. We were the first country to, in, in Latin America to put a tax on carbon, on carbon emissions, and we are uh, uh, completely uh, um, compromise to, to fulfill our targets there of lowering our emissions at least by 20% uh, as we signed the agreement. Uh, th those were just simply two examples of, of how you have to innovate, uh, think with a different approach, and persevere in order to fulfill your goals. And of course, the in order to be able to do that, we needed to have peace. A country at war, a country uh, at war in a war that had tremendous cost, of course, of human lives, um, but also from the environment point of view. Uh, the, the attacks on the oil pipelines, for example, if you add up how many oil has been spilled in our rivers and our and our seas, if you add, uh, if, if you sum up all these attacks, they're equivalent to 14 times the Exxon Valdez um, disaster that you remember was the worst disaster ever in the history of the world. 14 times. Uh, the war stimulated illegal mining. Illegal mining uses cyanide and mercury, which contaminate permanently the water. Uh, the war stimulated 
the production of coca, uh, drug trafficking, and uh, that ha was a tremendous stimulus to deforestate our Amazon uh, jungles. So one necessary condition to be able to uh, comply with the development goals, uh, sustainable development goals, was stop the war. That was difficult. It was a big challenge, but what, what did we do? We set ambitious goals. Uh, many people said that would be impossible. Uh, many, almost all of my predecessors had tried. They had failed. But again, innovate. Let's, let's have a different approach. So there, what I did was uh, I brought in some uh, uh, new and fresh uh, ideas. People who had experience, hand-on experience in other parts of the world to come and help me think how to do this, how to uh, initiate a, a peace process that could have a, 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 lar a, a large degree of success. And uh, they started giving me, giving me ideas. One idea that gave, that gave me that has been extremely important was in every peace process in the world, the victims have been neglected. They, they have never been taken into consideration. And they are the ones who had suffered the war. If you want to, if you want to have permanent peace, if you want to have a peace that lasts forever, you need to take the victims into account. And I said, that's a great idea. Uh, let's put the victims and let's put their rights, which are stipulated in a treaty called the Treaty of Rome that regulates the conflict resolutions of armed, the armed conflict re uh, resolutions uh, in the world. And they have four rights. The rights to uh, justice, the right to the truth, the right to reparations, and the right to non-repetition. So we said, let's put the victims in the center of the solution of this process, and let's start negotiating around the victims and their rights. The first thing we did was to approve a law that allowed us to repair the victims. We didn't we, we didn't even have a law that allowed us to repair the victims and to give the peasants uh, the land back that was taken from them because of the violence and start repairing the, the, and healing the wounds of the war even before we finished the negotiation. That was a crucial aspect. Another crucial aspect was uh, let's let's identify the stakeholders in the peace process. Who have been the ones who, for some reason or another, have been against the peace process or have been spoilers in the past? And uh, immediately the military emerged. And I said, well, then let's bring the military in to the process. So I uh, appointed two generals, the most prestigious generals, one from the army, one from the police, as key negotiators. And I started going around the country, explaining to the soldiers and the officers the, uh, a, a phrase that General MacArthur made um, famous that says, the soldiers never want war because they're the ones who put their life at risk. They always should fight for peace. And I told them, peace will be your victory Help me achieve that peace. And slowly, we were able to convince the military establishment that peace was the best in their interest also. Uh, it, was not, it was not easy because there's always full, all kinds of prejudice and all kinds of uh, suspicions. Oh, that they're going to then uh, make a peace and they will do away with the army and I will lose my job and I will have no benefits and many of those ideas that we had to, to erase from the minds of, of the military establishment, and they became uh, 
fundamental allies in this process. The other, other aspects of the peace process that were important. In today's world, asymmetrical wars that, like the one we had in Colombia, uh, you, it's very difficult to negotiate if you don't have the um, support of the region, of, of the countries that uh, are in some way or another affected by the, by the war or involved in the war. And so you have to use their diplomacy. And uh, I had a very bad relations, very bad relationship with, with uh, the then president of Venezuela, Chavez, very bad relationship with the then president of Ecuador. But I said, if I, need, if I want peace, I need to have a good relationship with them. And we sat down and we said, listen, you and I, we think very differently, but let's work together on what uh, your people and my people uh, uh, are in agreement that would be good for them, for all of us. And that is peace, peace around the whole region because the, it was the last armed conflict of the whole of the Americas. They said yes. They started helping in the peace process. That was another key factor, the regional support. Then the support of the whole international community. Uh, the United Nations uh, got involved, and they have been extremely, extremely supportive. The, uh, they say this is the only good news that the United Nations receives in many, many years is Colombia's peace process. Uh, the Security Council has already um, unanimously uh, approved three resolutions um, giving a mandate for us, for example, to, uh, to monitor the ceasefire, then to monitor the disarmament. Now the last of the arms of the FARC are in some containers being destroyed. And tomorrow I'm going to go with the Secretary General uh, to, uh, to signal the, the, the place where we're going to build a monument of peace with the arms that are, will be melted. And we have a, 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 uh, a what's it called, a concurso. Uh, a, a, a contest yeah, of, of the artists to see who, who wins. Uh, the monument, and then we will, be, we will build three monuments, one in, in the United Nations, one in Cuba, and one in Colombia. Cuba, why Cuba? Because Cuba was the host country. Why did we choose Cuba as a host country? Because it was an island, because it was secure, because the Cubans had a lot of influence in, our, in the guerrillas for many reasons. So we are now in the process of, of uh, finishing this phase, and starting the other phase, which is the construction of peace. Because peace is, uh, the silencing of the arms is the first phase, but it's, that's not peace. Peace, you have to construct it, it will, it will last a long time. You have to start by healing the wounds of millions of victims, displaced people, uh, changing your attitudes, um, or the Pope went to Colombia a few days ago. He went there specifically to help us reconcile. And he said, uh, Colombia needs reconciliation. This will take a long time. You have to change your attitudes, but you're going in the right direction. Go forward. And that's what we're doing now. So uh, these are three diff diff different examples of how we were able to put the Sustainable Development Goals in the agenda of the world and approved by the United Nations, how we have uh, two of the 17 goals, we, we have approached each goal with this uh, attitude of innovate, put high, uh, high uh, objectives, and persevere. And peace that we have now will allow us to fulfill, to, to be able to comply with the objectives much easier. Without peace, that would have been impossible. Without peace, you cannot go 
and uh, recuperate uh, a forest that had been destroyed without peace. You cannot fight poverty uh, as we are, are fighting poverty. So the peace was a necessary condition which have fortunately been fulfilled. Uh, this is the experience I wanted to share with you. Um, and uh, Professor, uh, you said that uh, there would be a question and answer. We have some time to uh, answer questions, and I hope this is a wonderful. Wow. Ending poverty, protecting the planet, reforesting, making peace. Not bad. Uh, very, uh, really wonderful. We have a very short period of time for maybe one question, maybe two. There is a mic. Uh, please, uh, right here, uh, if you could stand up, introduce yourself. Please be brief. Uh, the, the president has to leave uh, momentarily, and we have to clear the auditorium by 5 o'clock, so we'll just have maybe two questions. Virgilio Viana from Brazil, uh, Sustainable Amazon Foundation in Manaus. My question to you is a regional one. Uh, the Amazon is the biggest asset, uh, one of the biggest assets of Colombia and, and countries like Brazil as well. But the challenge that we have is to improve the coordination of activities among the countries so that we have something which incorporates the fact that the Amazon River begins in Peru, many rivers begin, or the Negro River begins in Colombia and they drain to Brazil and Brazil exports water through the clouds to the Andes. So we're all connected. My question to you is how can we improve coordination and integration among Amazonian countries? That's a very, very good question. Uh, no, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, Look at this coincidence. I am meeting your president tonight. Uh, uh, and you know, we're going to meet in the apartment or I don't know, in some place with uh, President Trump. Uh, and I'm going to hand him a letter uh, telling him that we need to push forward an idea called the AAA. The AAA is the Andes, the Amazon, and the Atlantic. Um, and that's, we, we, ha we, ha we have already uh, identified, we, we need the Guyanas also, and uh, part of Peru and part of Venezuela, but uh, Brazil, I know the, there, you have many NGOs there that are very, very excited about it. And yes, we need to coordinate uh, the, any action because uh, climate change doesn't know, doesn't, uh, know frontiers. You know, the borders, they, they, they don't, or species don't uh, identify frontiers. That's why collaboration and we have a responsibility, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, the, the whole Amazon basin, we have a responsibility with the world, and so we have to, we, there is a, a, a specific plan that we are going to um, pursue of how to better protect uh, the whole of the Amazon corridor, the AAA, and the different cultures. There's a lot of things that we have not discovered yet. Uh, we, we made a, a, a uh, we're making an experiment in Colombia. Um, one of the dividends of peace is uh, we now can go to many places that we, can go, we could not go before. And we're doing a replica of the uh, botanical expedition that was made 200 years ago uh, with today's technology. And we, we are making uh, 21 uh, mini expeditions. We have already done, I think it's 11 or 12. And we have already discovered, uh, Professor, more than 90 new species that were unknown to mankind. 
but there's a lot more. And if we collaborate, we can do, I don't know, we can discover many, many things that are there, hidden in our jungles, in our, in our richness, because I consider our jungles part of our natural richness, and that if we discover it and protect it correctly, everybody will win. Vicki Jen Eisler from Mediators Beyond Borders International. I commend you for the work you're doing and the excellent presentation. My question is, what role did the presence and involvement of women play in achieving the peace accord that you have been able to do in some of the work that you just described? Uh, thank you for, for reminding me because I know you had a panel before about women leadership. Um, the peace process, the peace process has, for the first time ever, a special chapter that has to do with gender and the protection of uh, the victims, the women are, the women are considered the victims of the victims because they are the ones who lost their kids, lost their husbands, got uh, raped. Uh, they are the, the the victims of the victims. So there is a special consideration in the post-conflict for the role of, of women in the creation, in the construction of the peace, because they have more credibility than we do. Uh, they have suffered more than we have. And so this specific peace process has given women a special role in the construction of peace, a special leadership there in order to be able to be more effective. We're, we've uh, reached the end of the hour. Let me, before uh, finally uh, thanking uh, our, our wonderful speaker, make two quick announcements. There are a very, very few tickets left for Carnegie Hall this evening. If you want to go, you better get online or rush to the box office because it's just a tiny number. It is your chance to see Yo-Yo Ma and other virtuoso, uh, other virtuoso artists. It's gonna be absolutely uh, a phenomenal evening. So if you can make it, please join. The second announcement is that tomorrow, it's at the faculty house. We look forward to seeing all of you there. There are spectacular sessions. Let me close by uh, mentioning that with all of this inspiration and great leadership, when we at the United Nations and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network look to how to bring the SDGs throughout Latin America, we wanted to establish an SDG center of excellence for the Americas, and for Latin America in particular, and of course the only place that one, the compelling place uh, is in Bogota at Colombia, in Colombia. So we will be launching an SDG Center of Excellence uh, at uh, Universidad de los Andes. Uh, and that will be early in uh, 2018. We hope many of you will be involved. We anticipate an absolutely thrilling a uh, new center of excellence that will attract uh, people from all over the world and that will be able to share these ideas from all over the world. And, Mr. President. And, and remember, high goals, innovate, and persevere. There we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Really wonderful. Thank you. Bravo.